Welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations on food and farming. Today's episode is hosted by Teresa Kiveny, SFA's Executive Director. She's going to call up Troy Daniel of the NRCS, and they'll chat about soil health work in Minnesota, the role of livestock, resiliency, and Troy's family cattle operation back home in Texas. And of course, since we recorded this episode, the pandemic looks a little bit different. So if you're wanting to visit your local NRCS office, be sure to contact them for more information about their opening status. Well, this morning I'm pleased to be having a conversation with Troy Daniel, who is the Minnesota State Director of NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I guess we'll start, Troy, by asking, what's a Texan like you doing in Minnesota? <laughs> well, good morning, Teresa. Uh, I guess opportunity. Uh, I, I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, last year, I'd been here just a year or not even a year, and it was a really hard winter. And I was wondering if that opportunity was worth it or not. <laughs> It's understandable. But, <laughs> but but this winter has been better, and, and I, I've recovered from last winter and enjoyed last summer, and it's just a beautiful state. But uh, I guess opportunity, I my kids, they're not gone necessarily, but they're grown. I still have one with me uh, attending college, but uh, I was kind of ready for a change in my career, and I wanted to do something before I – well, I still had good health and and opportunity came up here in Minnesota and I got the call from Bill Northy, yeah, the under the undersecretary and uh, couldn't tell him no. So I landed here almost two years ago. Come come July. Oh, I didn't know it was that long. Well, I'm really glad you're here, Troy. And tell us about the historical background of NRCS and what that means to you. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal to me. Uh, you know, we, we got our roots in the 30s. Uh, some people call it the dirty 30s and during the Dust Bowl years and Hugh Hammond Bennett, uh, who, who's kind of, I call him our godfather <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for conservation. But he, uh, you know, he, he foresaw the need for stronger conservation work in agriculture in America well before the Dust Bowl. Uh, and then one of those seize the moments came when the Dust Bowl occurred and, and all of us probably have heard the stories of uh, the soil blowing into Washington DC and to Chicago and probably here in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but uh, it really got the attention of of people all across the United States that we really need to do something to save the soil. So that became uh, what was the, uh, the uh, Soil Conservation Service mm -hmm. initially. And we kept that title up until the 90s and we changed it over to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. But I still think our foundation is with the soil because the soil is the foundation of everything. Um, you know, we talk about soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans. The key is the soil. Um, we wouldn't have the, the air or the clean air that we have without the processes and the foundation and bases of the soil. So no matter what we title ourselves, we're still in the business of conserving and hopefully rebuilding the soil of, of America and maybe leading the world and doing the same thing. Well, that leads to perhaps SFA's biggest priority, soil health. I know that NRCS has a soil health plan and that a number of agricultural and conservation groups in Minnesota are embracing the soil health principles. Wondering, can you just talk to us a little bit about the goals that NRCS has for soil health in Minnesota and maybe nationally as well? Okay, I'll, I'll try and paint the picture the best I can. Uh, you're correct. We have a lot of close partners here uh, in Minnesota, sustainable farming. Uh, 
uh, Soil Health Partnership. We've got the Soil Health Coalition that was formed last year. Uh, and then we're working with you know, our traditional soil and water conservation districts. Uh, a lot of the commodity groups are now coming on board to the importance of not just stopping erosion, which is kind of what our thing has been for the last 80 years, but actually rebuilding and, and revitalizing the soil. And so I think our vision here in Minnesota and probably from a national perspective is education. That's a key piece and, and getting the word out. Uh, one size does not fit all, but educating our, our public and our producers about the key principles of soil health and then teaching them and working with them hand in hand uh, to improve the soil. And it's going to take an all hands on deck approach. Uh, I don't think any one group's going to just make it happen. I think uh, there's a lot of cultural change that needs to occur. Um, you know, I grew up in a very traditional ag community and an ag family, and, and we don't change off the cuff. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, it, we're, we, I don't mean conservative in a political sense, but in a, in a cultural sense, we're pretty conservative because of things like the Dust Bowl and, and other things in economic train wrecks that have occurred over the last hundred years that people are cautious and, and rightfully so. You, you're making big decisions out there. So I'm getting distracted, but I think from a soil health perspective, in RCS Minnesota, myself and my staff, we want to get the message out and then we want to help facilitate and support producers in making those changes and transitioning to new ways of doing business and managing their land and then help them see the economic advantages as well as the environmental advantages so that, you know, what sticks in my mind and everything I do every day when I get up is, is the place I'm at now going to be better for the next 10 generations? And how can we move that little at a time across the nation? So uh, that's big picture. I could get down into the weeds of, you know, we've got a lot going on with uh, the mentoring program with folks like you and Soil Health Coalition. We've got demo projects going in all over the state. Uh, we've started talking to Discovery Farms about doing okay. some things with them and, and doing some some more and probably pulling you guys into the mix too because I think having a lot of demonstration projects and helping people with technical assistance and then kind of mentoring them uh, as they walk through a process to make change on their land is imperative. Well, what do you see as the biggest barriers to soil health adoption? And maybe the flip side, what are the biggest opportunities that you've seen? I, I'd say uh, the, the barrier probably is uh, cultural. Uh, there's also uh, probably a lack of enough, uh, there is a lot of research out there. I'm not going to say there's not research. We've got research going back to Thomas Jefferson days on the implications of soil health principles and practices. However, in recent years, uh, using, tying it to modern agriculture and the type of equipment we have, the type of uh, food system we have that we've developed over the last 60, 70 years, there's not a ton of what I'd call applied science out there, which is what producers are usually after. Uh, and I think that's where those demonstration projects will help that cause. But the cultural change and then uh, showing the economic value uh, that you don't necessarily have to be the top dog producer in the county. It may be more important that you're the top dog when it comes to profitability and sustainable economic hedging, 
uh, circumstances like we had last year with all the water and then hedging circumstances related to drought. So I, I think showing people the barrier might be just making sure people understand here's some options. You may not want to adopt all five principles, uh, but here's some options out there. If you can adopt one or two and make that cultural change, because it is, it's families, it's generational, uh, it's hard to break tradition. So I'd say that's the biggest barrier. Uh, cost effective, you know, the economic barriers of making a change to, to your uh, operation, which that's where some of our programs come in to help. Uh, you know, we've got our environmental quality incentive program that provides equip. certain equip is what it's typically called. Yep. Uh, we have our conservation stewardship program, CSP. Those are programs that help uh, maybe f make people feel a little more comfortable in making these changes and, and until they can feel secure that they've made the right change and, and leasing new equipment, purchasing new equipment, or sometimes selling equipment <laughs> because yep. they don't need it anymore. Or uh, converting their equipment into something else. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think those are uh, some of the barriers that, that I think we can tackle through public-private partnerships. Uh, I know for a fact we won't get it all done with federal or state tax dollars. I think it's going to take uh, not-for-profits. It's going to take for-profit, you know, companies getting involved, and it's going to take people like sustainable farming to help tie things together and just make it happen for people. But opportunities, uh, I think there is an opportunity. I, I think we can, we're can. we already starting to see more viable options for producers that are coming to light from an economic standpoint, a market-based system. Um, I tell people all the time it would be my wildest dream if NRCS uh, was, was, wasn't the mainstay of helping people make conservation happen except for technical assistance. It'd be nice if the financial side of it was on the market side, that we have markets that help drive conservation ethic, that help drive conservation decisions and management decisions. And I think we're getting there. Uh, we, I don't think it's going to magically happen overnight. I think the market itself has to transition and change. But I, I think there's a lot of, lot of companies, a lot of people out there, uh, a new generation coming up that, that they want a green society. They want uh, sustainability in our food system. They want conservation on the land. So how has NRCS been affected or in terms of programming and programs like EQUIP and CSP by the COVID-19 pandemic? Are there any changes that farmers need to be aware of or additional assistance that might expedite people making a transition at this really time of upheaval and reset? Uh, I'd say from our standpoint, it has impacted us a little bit. Uh, right now we're in a, in a uh, what we call a um, stage two type office operation. So we're currently, both us and Farm Service Agency, are not allowed to have customers in the office. Uh, so we're having to do a lot of business, just like we're talking now, either through Skype or Team or Zoom or over the telephone. Uh, in some cases, you know, if you can keep social distancing, uh, our, our folks are going out to the farm and meeting with farmers on their place. There's no healthier place on earth than being out in the country. So uh, as long as they're doing social distancing, they're still able to interact and provide assistance. Uh, we've amped up our our use of electronic tools for signatures and signature authorities uh, to help us keep the flow because we don't want people to just 
not participated in a program uh, that in some cases is gonna be vital and critical. I think all of us know the all the variables related to the market. You know, we had these waves uh, of challenges the last few years with not only the environment, the weather and the climate, but also trade agreements. And then just the traditional market curves that have occurred. And then now we've got this uh, pretty, pretty closed down situation where restaurants are not uh, up and running. And, you know, I, that probably hurt me as much as anybody. Uh, that's the biggest change in this whole thing for me personally is I love to go to a local restaurant. I'm not a chain person. I, I don't go to a lot of chain restaurants, but I, I love a local pub, a local restaurant. And I love knowing that I'm buying from a, a person right here in the city or in Lakeville or wherever that's a, a local business. So all that's impacted, uh, you know, the ebb and flow of our, our market system and our, of, of our groceries, our food. And I think it's, it's going to be a learning lesson uh, for the whole system. And I think we'll adapt. We're already seeing a lot of adaptations and industry is going to adapt, but you know, it ties right into some of the things that we promote is, is the better you are at taking care of your land and the better you are at taking care of your bottom line and, and kind of keeping things at bay, you hedge yourself against these big challenges that just pop up that we can't control. Uh, so I, I it's resiliency. It, resiliency is the key. And, and I, I've gotten a lot of calls the last couple of weeks and had discussions with people that have really bought in and are fully implementing the five principles of soil health. And they're worried, but I can tell by the stress level in their voice, they're not as worried as the guys that are right on the edge, you know, that are and I'm not saying those guys are doing something wrong. I'm just saying they are where they're at. And I know for me, uh, our cattle operation back home, uh, a drought a few years ago started me making me take things a little more serious, even on my own place, uh, about how we operate. And is it all about just maximizing productivity or is it really about maximizing resiliency to make sure that we can stay in business for the next generation or to sell to someone else that wants to take over a property. So I know I'm ranting and going on and on, but. No, you're not, you're not ranting. You're actually <laughs> causing me to reflect on one of the workshops that I went to this spring uh, dealing with the economics of soil health and the point that the presenters made, all of whom had been in various stages of soil health practice, ranging from two or three years to, I want to say, 11 or 12 years, they all emphasized that they no longer look at what their yield is. Well, certainly they look at it, but they look much more at what their bottom line is and that they have an improved bottom line and that the environmental benefits of soil health practices, they don't, that those are hard to measure. Um, they're intrinsic, it, it, they're improving the intrinsic value of their land. And if you add a value to that, then you're really increasing your profitability. And I, I would say getting over the hurdle of, I'm the top producer in the county to, I have one of the highest net per acre in the county, which is the main difference, I think, in how we calculate this. I think those are that that's a that's a barrier that we can overcome. Right, right. By telling the My, story. I agree. My grandfather always had these little sayings. Uh, you know, he, he was big. Almost a day didn't go by that he didn't talk about never getting all your chickens, all your eggs in one basket. Yes. <laughs> and that's part of the five principles too. Uh, you know, diversify, 
be resilient, manage across the board natural resources. Uh, but a, another thing he talked about all the time, and the older he got, the more he said it was, he would look at you and, and really commit. And, and he worked for the Soil Conservation Service for a few years right after the war. And I think it, it embedded certain principles in him that he would say, we've got to take care of our soil. We've got to rebuild. And he used the word rebuild our soil because he saw firsthand live and in concert, the Dust Bowl. Yeah, uh, We've got photos back home of soil right up into the house you know and and so he saw the the tragedy of that firsthand and and he knows for a fact that that damage can't just be fixed by saving the soil and and stopping it from movement we actually have to try to rebuild and regenerate kickstart that soil so that it becomes a healthy viable process again so um I, a lot of these things come to light when we have market crunches like we've had, and now we've got the COVID-19, even though it doesn't maybe directly impact a farmer, maybe they're healthy, they're staying healthy, their community's pretty healthy, but the economic impact worldwide is going to probably surface a lot of thought processes and producers can rethinking what they're doing. So we have a saying in SFA, agriculture done well heals. What comes to mind when you hear this? I think that's spot on with, with rebuilding and regenerating our soil. I think if we manage the resources we have, knowing that most of our planet, but for sure here in America, uh, you know, there's very few places in the United States that a plow hasn't gone into the ground. And those are usually because they're on top of a mountain or they're solid rock. Uh, so there's very few places that haven't been tampered with in some fashion. There's very few places that have not been impacted by natural disasters. So across the board there's always opportunity to heal the resources that we have whether it's vegetational or the soil itself and how it impacts the vegetation we've we've always got to be in a, a healing mode because there's always something that's going to break it down you know that, that's just ecology i'm an ecologist by education and natural ecology even even if man wasn't on this earth there's always going to be something that's damaging or setting back one resource or another and so there's always a need for a healing whether a biological healing or an ecological healing that has to take place and i think farmers have the best opportunity to to play a huge part in that uh, they're the smartest land managers on the earth. Uh, I would take a, and I hope somebody doesn't take offense to this, but I'd take a farmer's knowledge any day over a banker or a lawyer or anyone else. Uh, they know what makes the land do its thing. And they know that if they apply certain practices and management styles, that the land will heal. Uh, and it will recuperate and sometimes surprise us and do more than we thought it could do. Uh, Troy, well, I'm aware that you have a ranch and a cattle operation in Texas. I'm wondering if you could tell us about it and tell us how you're coping with the cattle market. Uh, well, I do have some cattle in Texas. Uh, it's I'm a member of a family. <laughs> uh, it's mostly a family operation. Uh, my grandfather's cattle are kind of the foundation of that. Uh, we've actually been farming and ranching in that county in Texas since 1848. Oh my. So it's a, it's, it's a long heritage. We're not large. Uh, I do have some family members that, that have full-time large operations, uh, primarily cattle operations. So, uh, 
uh, cattle are near and dear to me. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not against sheep and and I'm not against uh, hogs and things like that. But uh, cattle are my first love and maybe my second one might be horses and motorcycles. So, uh, but we we have uh, a cow calf operation. Uh, from time to time over the years, I have bought stocker calves and fed them out on wheat, what we call graze out wheat. It's a pretty traditional type operation in North Texas. Uh, we're kind of in the transition zone of the Blackland Prairie and the post oak savannas. So uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a good mix, mostly what I'd say tame pasture or introduced species. And uh, you know, a lot of our land was farmed at one time. Uh, the vast majority of it was in cotton at one time or another for at least two or three decades. So I would say it was rather depleted. Um, now my grandfather over the years, starting in the late seventies, uh, started to transition somewhat through some of the NRCS or SCS programs pasture, you know, field after field into pasture, uh, mostly because of driven by erosion. Uh, and, you, you know, at some point you get tired of building structures and terraces and fighting erosion. So uh, most of it has been transitioned over. In fact, the last 21 acres I put in the grass three years ago. So now we're 100% permanent grass. Um, we don't, we don't have any, I do have one grain drill left and I use it to overseed clover and such when I need to, but uh, we've kind of made that transition. Soil health is something that my grandfather was pretty tuned into and, but he, he never really took it to the full extent. You know, he was, uh, he would dream big, but take small steps. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and like a lot of farmers I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, right now, you know, my dad's health's kind of waning right now, but he's, he's in charge. It's, it's on my mother's side is, is the operation, but dad's kind of running the place and uh, I've got cousins that are helping out since I'm not there, but uh, we're weathering the market. We're probably going to have to, hold some calves that we didn't expect to hold. Uh, hopefully our grass will hold out through the summer, but that's, that's my background. Uh, it's my first love. It's, it's, I can't imagine life without dealing with cattle. <laughs> and can you share how you view cattle in the soil health sequence? I think uh, it, it's rather or important. Livestock overall. Yeah, I, I would say livestock in general. Uh, I, I think I've told you before, my background education-wise, I had a dual degree, but my love is ecology and rangeland ecology. And our ecosystems here in North America, 90% of them in, evolved and were managed either by indigenous people or, or later on European influence by large ungulates. Uh, so we've always had the presence of elk and bison and caribou and, you know, deer are browsing and grazing and wild hogs. And, and then eventually cattle uh, were brought in by, you know, Spaniards and, and people coming in the first community. So everything we see has come, come to light with some kind of an animal on it. And I, I think we've learned uh, kind of this back and forth the last couple of hundred years, uh, a lot of land has gone back and forth between cropping and then back to grass and cropping and grass. And when we are talking soil health, uh, you can only take it so far uh, with the right vegetation you know, having the right root system in the ground, uh, having soil building uh, plants, you know, selection of plants. So you can only take things so far, but there's a missing piece. Uh, and of course, I'm a big fire buff too. Fire has its place, but uh, 
that disturbance that happens with livestock really amps up the biological activity in the soil and in the plant community. So it's nature. Uh, there's a lot of science out there that that can tell you details about how, you know, literally the tongue of the cow can impact a local plant community, uh, just the, the enzymes and such off of the animal, the slobber of a cow, uh, the manure that comes out of the cow, the hoof action, uh, the prehensive style that a cow or a horse or a sheep how they graze all impacts a local plant community and a soil community and how they interact with each other so they're saying you know carbon sequestration carbon recycling all that plays in and I, I really see livestock as a critical tool I know that not every operation is going to want to step off into livestock uh, I know there are a lot of people in Minnesota that are interested and kind of nervous because they didn't really, you know, they weren't either brought up with livestock or trained uh, with utilizing livestock, but they're a critical tool. And I think for some people, a value added market piece, yes. uh, you know, so it's, uh, and, and it, it doesn't always have to be cattle. You know, we've got sheep producers here that are doing some good things with soil health. Uh, I, I'd like to see some of our horse people do some good things with soil health. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there, but uh, we've got elk operations. We've got bison operations, but- Pastured pork, yep. Yep, we have pastured pork. I've got a cousin in Texas that's been doing that for years. He called them, you know, range, range pigs. Uh, I've got another cousin that does range chickens. So there, there's lots of opportunity to stimulate that ecosystem and, and that soil using livestock rather than a piece of equipment or, um, you know, a, a chemical or something man-made. And I think it's a good opportunity that we need to probably encourage. Troy, what are you most proud of regarding NRCS's accomplishments? What shines in NRCS's history or in recent history? I think uh, just knowing that I, I'm a customer service person. Um, I preach it. I try to live it the best I can. Uh, it's an ethic that was instilled in me as a child. But I think our greatest pride for most of us, I, I, it makes my day. I, w I was out just last week on a property and when a farmer tells me that they brag about the service and the technical assistance that they received, whether it be something small or large from one of our employees and help them solve a problem. So I guess we're known as helping people solve problems or challenges or make improvements. And that's kind of a niche. Uh, there's really nothing in the US that does that like we do. I mean, we have a presence in darn near every county in the United States. And so I think that's what we're known for and we, we have to stay true to that. And it, it can be a challenge, uh, political whims and various things in society make it a challenge. But uh, I tell our employees all the time, if everything we do is focused on the customer and helping the customer manage their resources and manage their property, we'll be okay. And uh, so I'd, I'd say we're known for customer service and helping get things done, you know? Well, you mentioned before, one of the things you miss with our stay at home orders is going to local restaurants. Uh, tell us how else you have been impacted and how you're weathering the stay at home order and some of these kind of travel reductions. You doing okay? Is your family doing okay? Eating? Food? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're doing okay. Uh, we get outside a lot, uh, wife and my daughter, and the daughter's doing her college classes online. Uh, 
So that's been kind of interesting, but uh, we try to get outside a lot. We've, we've done a lot more hiking here in Minnesota. There's a lot of opportunities for outdoors. Uh, I ride a motorcycle. So I've, now that the weather's broke, I've been trying to ride my bike to keep my insanity or sanity. Uh, <laughs> or some insanity. people may, yeah, it could be insanity, but uh, I do miss, uh, you know, I, I'm, starting to get out a little more and, and we're comfortable where producers are comfortable to meet. Uh, I'm going to start doing that, maintaining social distancing and things like that. But uh, I, I do miss that personal interaction of office visits because I'm real big on visiting the field offices and visiting with our farmers and people like you and, you know, and going to the meetings we have and the tours, field tours and things. Uh, I hope, this breaks uh, soon enough that we can still get some of that done this year, you know, when the weather's good, because uh, I think those social interactions are a big piece in helping move the conservation needle. Um, just the, the ability for producers and our folks and your folks to talk shop at the coffee shop or a cafe or the bar or wherever the case may be, or just out on the farm, that social interaction does way more for conservation than any program out there. We call that networking, farmer to farmer networking. <laughs> That's, That's right. Mark, I guess. Well, yep. I really appreciate your spending time with us this morning and uh, wish you well for the weekend. And I hope to see you out in the community this summer and that we can uh, see some, uh, some people at some uh, gatherings and field days, whether it's a smaller gathering to respect any restrictions with COVID-19 or not. But thanks so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. It was good to see you even by phone. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Uh, take care, Teresa. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer Network, visit sfa-mn.org.